Doing a daily Bible devotional has been the best thing that I've done for myself. My time in the Old Testament only proves to me again and again and again that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked above all things. When I'm reading the New Testament, I read it within the context of when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything in the New Testament is just an expansion of one of those two thoughts. Those are the two lenses through which I think with my mouth open as I read through the Old and New Testaments. Join me, won't you, for another adventure in Coffee, the Bible, and Page. Greetings. Welcome to another fabulous day in the Lord's neighborhood and to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. I am Page, your Caffeine Imbued host. Here's my coffee. Mm. In the beginning, coffee and low, it was very, very good. Well, we are going to continue our jaunt into 1 John. We're up to chapter 4. And just, again, to keep the context clear, uh, I've discovered from my own personal devotionals, that I have to continually keep in mind the framework, the contextual framework that I'm working within when I'm reading something so that I can get as close to the original intent of the author as possible. Um, Now, I'm not a biblical scholar, so uh, I'm not going to get this perfect. But here's my understanding where we're at with John. Things are starting to get pretty screwy theological wise in the church and John is at the end of his life and he wants to he wants to attack these things and to reinforce what he has been teaching his entire life there are some teachers beginning to teach that the God of Jesus isn't the God of the Jewish scriptures Israel's God the God of the Jewish scriptures is vengeful vindictive and capricious Israel's God is not the God of Jesus that's what these teachers were teaching the God of Jesus is kind and benevolent. Now, on the offset, hey, that looks that might look good. It might look okay. What's the big deal? The big deal is it gives these false teachers all the excuse they need to dismiss everything connected with the God of Israel, which includes Torah, which includes synagogue worship, temple worship, the law and the prophets. If they can get rid of that, then they can invent whatever they want to invent. They can redefine the Christian faith. They can redefine Christian worship uh, in in whatever manner they want. Um, And uh, the apostles and their letters, Paul's writings, John, Peter, all these folks, as their writings were based on interpreting and applying Torah to this new Christian uh, movement, then they can also get rid of these guys' letters. So that's this is an attack on apostolic authority. This isn't just an aberrant uh, group of weirdos that are just that have their own little corner on the uh, religious market. No, this is an attack on apostolic authority and on the authority of God's word. So that's what's going on here. These teachers were also attempting to redefine Jesus himself. You see, he couldn't really be God, they would say. They would come up with all kinds of incredulous ways of trying to define him. And John attacks that time and again in his gospel and in his epistle, clearly saying that Jesus is God. Not only that, Jesus is God in the flesh and is absolutely the God of the Old Testament. You remember his first gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And later he would say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John is going to circle his wagons around a couple very, very basic truths. And he's hammering at this thing time and time again in this epistle. 
So when we read this, keep in mind who he's dealing with. He's dealing with these false teachers that would want to redefine Jesus, that would want to uh, dismiss Torah, what we or what we would call the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. Um, they want to emphasize their authority based on their visions, on their uh, supernatural revelations, and therefore remove the authority of the apostles from the church. That's the battle that John is, is in. So let's get started. Let's look at the first three verses. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world. I used to hold a Bible study. One of the guys had invited a girl he was dating to the Bible study, and it's easy to see why he was dating her. She was gorgeous. But at the beginning of the Bible study, she did something very curious. She took out a small board that she had in her purse, and then she took out some fruit she had, and she started arranging the fruit in a very specific pattern on this board. Now, I was at the time studying Eastern religions in order to understand them more completely. I didn't know everything about everything, but I knew what she was doing. She was setting up an altar. I asked her what she was doing. She readily admitted that she was setting up an altar. I asked her to please put that altar away as this was a Bible study. I told her that we were going to be discussing Jesus, and she said, oh, I love Jesus. So I asked her, well, then who is Jesus? She responded with a rambling diatribe about how he was a great teacher, a holy man, etc. I then asked, yeah, but is Jesus God? I couldn't nail her down. She wouldn't answer the question. See, John just said in verse 3 of the chapter that every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Now, if I remember correctly, the, the results of this, this is back in 1976 or 77, she got very disruptive and angry, and her boyfriend took her home. Later, I talked to him and told him, look, she's not from God. I went on and told him that there was something spooky and wrong about her and asked him to not bring her back to the Bible study. As I was a very young Christian myself at that point, I was unaware of what demonic possession looked like and didn't realize until later that she was demonstrating many of the traits of someone who is under demonic possession. All I knew at the time was that she would not recognize Jesus as God, and she became very agitated and combative when asked about Jesus. You see, the enemy of our soul will say all sorts of nice and wonderful things about Jesus, holy man, great teacher, illuminary, etc. But the enemy will not come out and confess that Jesus is God and has come in the flesh. This strikes at the heart of the false teachers that John is addressing. Now, verse 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Now, I wonder if the reason these heretics left the church in chapter 2, we see that happening, is because the true believers in the Ephesian church stood so strongly for the truth that the false teachers and believers had no choice but to leave. Just a thought. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Hmm. I know that there are some brilliant people outside of Christianity. They display marvelous wisdom in the sciences, philosophy, literature, music, religion, etc. Sometimes, however, they take all of that brilliance and they attempt to interpret our faith in order to make it make sense to them, or sometimes even to outright attack it and discredit it. To the unbelieving world, what they say makes sense. 
And, and when people like that are found to be in leadership positions in the Christian church, there's no end to the confusion and division that they can cause. And trust me, there are those like this in leadership in some of today's churches. They redefine who Jesus is. They redefine the words of God. They have managed to become the center of their following to the point that many don't even see the need to read the word on their own. Why should they? This leader tells them what the Bible says. Hmm. John goes on to say, they are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. You see, the absolute best defense and offense against this is to be absolutely clear about who Jesus is. Remember John's words, the word was with God, the word was God, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. I know I keep bringing that up, but that's the heart and soul of what John's preaching and teaching in this epistle. He's telling his people, look, the spirit of the Antichrist will not recognize that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. It won't recognize that no one comes to the Father but by him. The world says all mountains point to the sky, all rivers run to the ocean, which is simply their way of saying Jesus is a way, but not the way. But that is not what Jesus says. That's not what John says. John says Jesus is God. The world won't say that. But the simple truth is this. Jesus is God. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives us and his love is made complete in us. Wow, what's John saying here? You know, I heard an old rabbi once concerning how he read the Ten Commandments and understood the Ten Commandments. Pretend it's God speaking. If we have a relationship, you and I, then as a result of that relationship, you will have no other God before me. The rabbi was saying that obedience to the law springs from a proper relationship with Jehovah. If I am in relationship with God, my desire will be to obey him. See, in this passage that we just read, John is reminding us of the central part that true love plays in the church. The example he gives us is how God himself demonstrated his love for us. This kind of love has a sacrificial center to it. God showed his love. By sacrificing his son for us, John is calling the Ephesian believers to practice this sacrificial put other people's needs before our needs kind of love. A true believer will not walk away from his or her brother or sister in Christ. This is in contrast to what we just saw in Ephesians, in the Ephesian church as discussed in chapter 2, where there was a group of people that left them. A true believer will not walk away from his brother or sister in Christ. You see, love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. We have a relationship with him, so we love them. We have a relationship with God, so we love him. What have we been saying through the entire Gospel of John in this epistle? The central truth of John's message is love God, love your neighbor. That's what Jesus said. As well, Jesus, when asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, oh, that's easy. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two hang all the law and the commandments. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God. The love that God has for us. He said, John is basically saying, here's another litmus test. If someone's really of God, they recognize and confess, they acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. Now he goes on and talks more about this love thing. 
God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. How is love made complete? Well, love like Jesus did. You know, I'm going to say it, but this is a central truth I'm constantly being reminded of between John's gospel and this epistle. Love God, love your neighbor. John goes on to say, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because Fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. <laughs> There's no fear in love. There's no fear of losing your relationship with God. Why? Because God loves us. He's not going to divorce us. False teachers, in my observation, sometimes use fear to control and subjugate their followers. But in God's church, fear is not used as an incentive to remain in his family. A true Christian teacher won't be saying stuff like, if you don't do this or that, or if you don't believe this or that, if you follow anyone else but me, your salvation's in jeopardy. You'll never hear that from a God-fearing church or a God-fearing teacher. I've heard all of that at one time or another in my lifetime, and they were hearing that in the first century church. I have heard with my own ears church leaders say things like this. Probably the most Stark example of something like this would be um, Jim Jones. You can go Google him. Uh, he started off as, as a minister of the gospel, a preacher. And in the beginning, was saying very orthodox, Christianese type things. But he eventually took his followers and left and got, went down to South America or Central America. I can't remember which now. Jonestown. And... He got all his followers to drink poison and die with him. That's the false teacher. And he looked and sounded the part in the beginning, but he left the body because he wasn't a true believer. And he just absolutely epitomized the statement, if you don't do this or that, if you don't believe this or that, if you follow anyone else but me, your salvation's in jeopardy. That was Jim Jones. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. This is how love is made complete among us so we have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Because of this, of this relationship I have with God, I'm not afraid of what happens when I die. There's no fear. Love is complete in me. When this body quits working, I will not be in fear of what God will say. I know what God will say. He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I am looking forward to that day. Verse 18, John says, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. I had a friend of mine who believed that if he went to bed at night and forgot to confess a sin committed during the day and he died in his sleep, he would go to hell. He lived in constant state of fear and agitation, constantly on the lookout for things that could be sin in his life. And there was no love or joy there. He believed that his relationship with God was founded on his ability to obey the laws of God. John says in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Now, I don't know in my relationship with my wife, which one of us loved first, but I do know that the minute I saw her, I was smitten and I started showing her evidence of my smittenness. I think I just invented a word. And she responded. Before long, we were responding to each other's acts of love and care for each other with other acts of love or care. And that is the way it is with us and God. When you are in relationship with him, he did love us first. We love because he first loved us. And then out of response to that love, we love him back. How do we love him back? Well, love is an outward expression. Love is an outgoing thing, not just an inner glow. If you love something, you're involved with that something. I love my wife. I'm involved with her. There is no other woman on the face of this planet for me but her. She loves me. There's no other man on this planet for her except me. Whoever claims to love God, though, and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they've seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. 
and he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Growing up, I had two brothers and a sister. As of now, I have one brother left, my younger brother, Pat. And when we were growing up, we fought sometimes, like cats and dogs. But I know for a fact that if required, Pat would charge hell with a bucket of water and a squirt gun for me, and I would do the same thing for him. And if by any chance we were fighting and someone else came in and tried to involve themselves in our fight, we'd put aside whatever it was we were squabbling about, and we'd take care of that piece of business together. Because you don't mess with my brother. And Pat would say, you don't mess with my brother. And I love him for that. We're family. He has my back. I have his. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You're called to love your family. In this epistle, John is delineating the difference between false and true. The false Gnostic heresies as opposed to Christian truth. Now, here's another really important thought. Rather than spending his time really explaining the ins and outs of the Gnostic heresies in this letter, he's spending time telling us what truth looks like. There are so many confusing variations of Gnostic error. John has chosen to give us detailed instruction on what the real truth looks like, rather than chase down every rabbit trail of Gnosticism. An example in today's life would be when people are being trained to detect counterfeit money. They don't study all the different kinds of counterfeit money that have been made. They study the real deal. They study the real money to the extent that they cannot help but notice false when it shows up. Because there's a bazillion ways out there to make fake money. They just study the real deal to the point where they can immediately spot the forgery. See, John is laying out the truth. And he's having his people, his followers, and us focus with laser-like precision on the truth. Love. Love is the earmark of the believer. Love for God. Love for your neighbor. If you love God, you're going to love your neighbor. The kind of love that John writes of requires a foundation of relationship. Love is expressed within the confines of a relationship. I love my wife. I serve her however I can. She loves me. She serves me however she can. There's no set rules in our household about who cooks and who cleans. We both cook. We both clean. We both serve each other. We both love. If she needs help carrying something to the car, I carry it to the car. If I need help getting something to the truck, she helps me take something to the truck. We serve each other. We love each other. That's the mark of a brother or sister in Christ. That's the mark of a Christian. Now, can you see the purpose behind John's hammering away at this concept of love? I do. I saw it in his gospel, and I see it in this epistle. He's telling the church, your best defense against the spirit of the Antichrist is love. If God's love is in you, God's love will come out of you. If you are truly in his family, you will love. There's no other way to say it. I'm so grateful for this reminder. How do you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind? Well, we've said this before. You're going to read your Bible. You're going to talk to him. You're going to enjoy his family. How do you love your neighbors yourself? Again, love is outward focused. You just don't have kindly emotional feelings towards somebody and call that loving them. God's love is extremely practical. If they're hungry and you have food, you feed them. If they're naked and you have clothes to spare, you clothe them. You find ways to love. John is laying out the absolute thing that separates these false teachers from the apostolic teachers from these false believers, the true believers. One of the earmarks of this group of people that left the church, and I've seen it in my own personal life in churches that have gone through church splits, it's hatred that produces divisiveness. Hatred causes people to leave. Anger causes people to leave. Love implores people to stay. The mark of a true believer is that he loves God and he loves his neighbor. 
the mark of a true believer is that he recognizes the authority of God's words, which in this first century would have been the law and the prophets. All the apostles, all the epistles, the gospels are really drawing all their inspiration from the scriptures that were at hand. And what scriptures were at hand? The law and the prophets, the Jewish scriptures. We call it the Old Testament today. The false believers will not recognize that Jesus has come in the flesh. True believers, true teachers will not seek to redefine Jesus. They stick and adhere to what Jesus said with his own mouth. Today's teachers will look at the Gospel of John and there's no question in their mind who Jesus is. He's God. These false believers hate. True believers love. False believers redefine Jesus. True believers stick to what the scriptures tell us about Jesus. False believers would dismiss the words of God and use their own inspirational things to teach people. True believers rest on the word of God. John is being very practical. All right, well, that's a good spot to stop. I'm Paige. Here's my coffee. Folks, I'm out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, what did you think about today's Bible devotional? Email me and let me know your thoughts at ffog at me.com.